Hello, everyone. It's fellow Agorians, hello. We are uh, back yet again with another one of our Conversation With series. Um, we have, um, we, of course, David is, uh, David Hubert is here with me. I'm going to bring him in in a second. We have uh, kind of an obscure guest today. He's worked on some things that you might not have ever heard of before. It's small movies called, like, uh, I don't know, something about dragons, how to train your dragons. I don't know. I, 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 I. I, I think we, he, it'll be an interesting conversation nonetheless. So we have uh, Simon Otto here, um, who was the head of animation uh, for uh, for the, all, the whole trilogy, as a matter of fact. And um, let's uh, let's bring in David, and um, I'm going to let him kind of read in Simon because he's a bit of a um, bit of um, bit of his past. There you go, David. Come on in, buddy. Here we go. There you go, buddy. Hey. Oh, David. hey, Brent. Hey, Bear. How are you? <laughs> Fancy meeting I'm you here you. yet again. Yes, Simon Otto. Finally. Yep. Yes, yeah. exactly. The the moment is finally here. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I've Simon. I had the uh, opportunity to 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 work with uh, Simon uh, at DreamWorks. Uh, he's he, he was in my top ten list of the the people that I wanted to to bring for those uh, the discussion. Um, yeah, started as a traditional two D animator, switched to three D animation. Uh, spent twenty one years at DreamWorks. For more than a decade, he, he was the head of character animation on How to Train Your Dragon. Um, and more recently, uh, started to be a freelance uh, director and um, and with a little project that he just completed at, uh, direct um, not long ago. That's something that we hopefully will be able to talk a little bit about during our discussion. Yeah, there'll be. I think there'll be a couple things to learn from that 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 little conversation. Um, well, okay. Well, without further ado, let's bring in the man of the hour and um, let's pick his big brain. Simon Otto, everybody, there he is. <laughs> Do I have to it's like? Simon. <laughs> you should you be guys. like the only way you 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 need to have like a heavenly god of light shining on you now. I think is the only way you could possibly live up to the. Although uh, I'm no, pretty thank sure. you so much. That 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 was very kind. Way too kind. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, Simon, maybe to kick uh, uh, thing uh, things off. So, you started as a traditional animator, um, and so if I'm not mistaken, the Prince of Egypt was your first gig at DreamWorks, oh, right? Wow. right? I know that one. Yes. Um, and Does I that think age it, me. Does that age me? Ages me so slightly. Bad. I think it ages all of us because we all remember that movie going to the theater. So it ages those people who've seen it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Other people are just completely untouched. They're like, "What?" That's right. You used to be animating with a with a pencil. What? What are you talking about? I know. Um, and your transition to three uh, D was right after, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, as well. Right. Oh, say, right sorry. After say it again. 
I so was so seriously tra distracted because JP, J, JD Haas just popped up. Oh, don't, don't look at this. He's twist. going to distract you. <laughs> oh, sorry, is he in the background? <laughs> High five. I thought Yogi. I blocked him a long time ago. Hold on a second. Let me take care of that. <laughs> um, so tell me, when you made this transition from, because it, it, it's, you know, there, there was this uh, golden age of traditional an animation in the 90s, and then, you know, this was slowly, everything was going toward uh, CG. On your side, did you have any apprehension going from 2D or, or Oh, or yeah, 3D? big time. I mean, I um, you have to kind of put yourself back to what time in CG animation that was also, where um, we had just, uh, DreamWorks had just released, and, uh, you know, to great success. Um, so we started sort of uh, sharing kind of knowledge with, um, with the PDI animators, and I think one of the presentations was Raman Hui or somebody showing us how they animated. And the very first, I think it was the first half of Ants. And, and there's probably some people out there who are going to correct me and how exactly went on. Since I wasn't there, I don't know. But um, the presentation was like giant spreadsheets. And Raman Hui apparently has this famous uh, presentation where he animates a walk cycle and never renders it. So giant spreadsheets, no 3D viewer. Just, um, you know, basically, uh, okay, 15 up, 15 down, uh, 10 frames later, 15 up, 15 down, like whatever, like, and then, you know, the arm swings and the, the cross uh, position and the, and the spread leg position, and then you hit, uh, render, and then you wait for seven minutes, and then you have a walk cycle in front of you. Like, and we were, the, we were sort of drawing, you know, keyframes, breakdowns, in-betweens, and like we're you know obviously studying the nine old men to great detail <laughs> and like the promise of going from that to that was extremely unappealing and then so, you know so, i think so it, it felt of, yeah. it, it felt almost like a, a programmer that would it, it felt like a complete different uh, uh art form at, at that point i yeah. can imagine yeah yeah it was i mean and and certainly um we that was part of the reluctance is like okay well yeah yeah maybe uh, you know a, a guy who sculpts with clay can then go and sculpt with you know um, mar marble but it's you know it, it the tool you're so familiar with all of a sudden is is is, is a completely different thing and it feels different so i mean i was split to be honest I, because i was one of the more younger animators i was kind of also feeling like Maybe there's something there. And I obviously love Toy Story, and it was a big, big, big inspiration. So I was torn, I have to say. And then I think it was Spirit when some of the um, like the horses were the, the crowd horses were animated in CG, and I was supervising the eagle uh, in that film. And the very first shot, the opening shot, this is the most heart crushing moment of my early career. Oh, I was yeah. so fired up that I, they gave me this character, which was my uh, my first supervising job. Um, and uh, sorry, it was my second. I was uh, wait, no, no, I don't know which order. Yeah, El Dorado. I did. No, sorry, um, not El Dorado. Yeah, so we went from Prince of Egypt to El Dorado to Spirit to Sinbad. Yes, it was my first supervising job, <laughs> and uh, I was given this character, which is the eagle, and wasn't so much in it except for the very beginning. It was a uh, I mean, a, a 20 second shot of the eagle flying through um, uh, sort of this landscape. And besides that, maybe there was another 20 seconds of total footage in the film. The rest was like just this little, car this little dot in the sky. And at some point, they decided that that opening shot was going to be animated in CG. And I was like, what? Like, I had already like developed the character and, and, um, uh, and so that was animated in CG, and I had like created cycles, and then working with Mike. Oh my God, I'm blanking on Mike's last name. Who a CG animator who did a beautiful job in animating in CG. But mm -hmm. when they told me this is going to be animated in CG, I was like, you, no, you can't do that. Like this is it's <laughs> never going to be good enough. It's not going to look like the rest. And I had all my arguments pre presented, you know. And of course, I was wrong because in the end, it was the right. Of course it was the right choice like i wouldn't want to do that it's basically the same drawing for 20 seconds right uh and there's you know yeah. <laughs> and doing it in cg was so you could have so much so much more immersive and and it was yeah. a real pain in the neck to do that in 2d so it was the right mm -hmm. choice but we were bucking it big time do, do you feel that you ever got to the same level of uh expertise 
that that mm -hmm. you had in 2D once because at some point I imagine that there was a period of okay let's let's learn the software let's get uh, used to it which at some point you mm -hmm. you did but do, do did you ever feel as much in control of your characters in 3D in than when you were yeah than when you were anime, uh, animated um, animating in 2D I mean, I think we, we we ended up doing even better animation in 3D than we did in 2D from a performance point of view and a sort of sophistication point of view. Like the, the drawings, I mean, you could argue this. I mean, it, in a way, it's, it's, it's really not comparable. But I mean, for I mean, you personally. For me personally, I, I, yeah, when I, you I were felt like I felt like I ended up doing better work in 3D than in 2D. Um, but I also, uh, like... Maybe it's because in 2D, uh, you know, I, I was surrounded by Christoph Seron and James Baxter, who were like doing three times the footage and five times the quality. So you always <laughs> felt so, like what, one of the big differences between 2D and 3D is that the, this, the difference between the best animators and the second best animators, uh, who are also still really good, is very steep. So, mm. so the, the lesser animators, if you can call them, and the best animators, the difference in, in 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 quality is so much bigger because the, the the ability to draw and have a natural appeal in your drawing uh, separates the boys from the men <laughs> much more than in CG, I think. So in a way, in CG, there's a bit more of a level playing field. So of course, even in CG, there's a huge dis difference between the best animators and the and sort of your um average animators but it's much smaller than it was in 2d i think i'm gonna see a lot of like uh messages here like i don't totally disagree <laughs> with it I have opinions <laughs> at least the <laughs> hounds exactly um and so i i, I want to skip ahead and go right to uh, uh how to train your uh, your dragon uh if you were told uh, uh, before they, they, they offered this opportunity that you would be working for more than a decade <laughs> on three feature, would you have accepted that offer? I think so, yeah. yeah. Because that would mean, I mean, the only thing, I, I don't think Shrek was that far, even I did Shrek 3. I think with the Shrek, where the first two, mo where two movies were done when Dragons 3 came out, as Dragons 1 came out, I'm not sure... I think Shrek 3 was after that. I mean, uh, Shrek was the only thing I could compare it to, right, in terms of trilogy. And I wasn't, I mean, I was a fan of the films, but I wasn't a fan of the animation necessarily. And, and I think they did some great stuff uh, down the road. But again, coming from the snobbery of a 2D animator, um, that felt felt not what, what I wanted to do. But um, Dragons was a really interesting world to me from the get-go. And so I think... If you had told me that that was going to be a 12 year journey, I would have taken it because that would have meant that those movies were meaningful. And, and mm. uh, I think if, if there's one thing I can take away from Dragons is that it, it reached an audience beyond anything else that I've ever worked on. Like mm. to this day, yeah. I mean, my, one of my friends just sent me a video of his daughter watching Dra Dragons 1 over and over. Like she, he mm -hmm. texted me like, this is the fifth time this week that she's watched a movie. And she like, like the, that was just like, that's really powerful. And I don't think, I mean, there's other movies that have reached an audience uh, and have fans, but Dragons definitely like is a completely yeah. different ball game when it comes to that. So yeah, no, I, I, it's so rewarding still to this day to have worked on that film. I'm curious, um, having gone through all that and, and that, that, you know, just this realization that it, it has reached an audience well beyond your, your original imagination. I'm curious, and it, it may, this may, this is too difficult, but I'm wondering if there's one specific thing that you could boil it down to, like, what do you feel like was the secret of that success? Like what, what was it about the, how to train your dragon trilogy that somehow captured. Cause I remember myself, I, I still full disclosure. When I, when I saw that movie, I had not been in a, a, in doctrine with any of the actual marketing for whatever reason, I must've been living in a cave at the time. I was mm -hmm. at the theater. I was going to, to see the, a, a different movie and it was sold out. I swear to you, this is so true. And then I, I looked and I'm like, Oh, and there's this cool, there's a dream, new DreamWorks movie out. It looks kind of interesting. And it was like this big, it was in 3d. I think the, 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 the showing that I saw, and it was like this big 3d car cardboard cutout. And I'm like, 
let, let's go try it. I was blown away. I think part of it was it's hard because I have a hard time separating my I had no expectations going in because I knew nothing about it. But mm -hmm. I just remember being completely completely captured by that movie like 100 mm -hmm. and i'm not just saying this because you're here i really was and i remember it, it stayed with me and then because of that feeling i went i definitely saw the the other two but i'm wondering like i i spent some time thinking about it myself but i'm curious what you think is at the center of that magic like what was it about that that made it such a breakout success god it's a really good question it's a really difficult question to answer yeah because sure. I, I mean there's two aspects of it the first one is the filmmaking team mm -hmm. and the other one is the contents of the of of, of the, the the product, right? The ingredients in the product, and and you could analyze how to train it. So, if I had to boil the ingredient aspect of it down to its basics, it's it's a very universal story with a very universal structure that mm -hmm. we know works, right? It's cowboys and Indians. It's um, uh, you know, it's a it's it's a love story. It's a boy and a dog. Yeah. It's the Black Beauty. It's a lot of like classic kind of um, film uh, genres or, or, or classic structure, plot structures. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it presents it in a way that surprises you. Um, yeah. And that paired with the wish fulfillment aspect of this, of this film is, I think, what ultimately delivers it. Um, you know, then you could take that and still make a crappy film, I think. Yeah. And sure what I think what was maybe lightning in a bottle is, I mean, A, the combination of uh, Dean, Dean DeBlois and Chris Sanders. You know, one is the sort of very level-headed, um, uh, you know, problem solver that can kind of, you can throw anything at him and he will find a way to make it fit into the story and make it perfect. Like, you, it makes sense. You go like, yes, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, he solved some pretty incredible story problems along the way. And then you have Chris Sanders, who um, in I, I have rarely seen somebody better in the creative brainstorming mm -hmm. of coming up with ideas that feel like, oh, yeah, that's totally yeah. different. I didn't think about yeah. that. You know, like Tufa's getting up on his hind legs and walking away like a <laughs> like, like some kind of a man in a suit and making it work to this dragon. Like that, those kind those kinds of things. Uh, I mean, Chris, in that sense, inspired us all to to think differently without ever like he never like <laughs> told us you guys must think differently. It's just the fire <laughs> in the room right. that all of a sudden inspires you right. to oh my god, there's like we can think about this from different angles and something mm -hmm. different. And then you know you 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 throw a, along with that you know sort of the producing team, the studio at the moment, that, um, the desire to do something different, the chance to do something different, different. Yeah. The composer, I mean, John Powell's score on that movie is mind-bogglingly great. I mean, that's I can turn that on and gives me chills, even though I've heard it a hundred thousand times. Um, you know, to the to the the I mean, the animators, the the I mean, I'm talking about the animators and the story artists because I've seen it more, and but of yeah. course, on the visual effects side and and lighting side, there were a lot of really good people that all of a sudden had an opportunity to do something different, and right. they were. They're all I mean, hungry for it. You know, I just saw this really great TED talk, and I forgot the woman's name. He's talking about the collective genius um, of, of of great leadership, like creative leadership. And, you know, obviously talking about uh, what's going on at Pixar and uh, Apple and Google and all these places. And I really think that's what happened at DreamWorks uh, on Dragons and some other films too, like Panda, where all of a sudden you had some great creative leadership that allowed that mm. brought the talent that was inside yeah. those crews out. Right. And you take that and you map it onto a, uh, you know, this wish fulfillment story and all yep. of a sudden something really magical happened. That's interesting. And then the it's surprising. Like, yeah. And then, and like all those surprising things that happened, like, hey, hey, oh, should I not spoil this? I think I can spoil dragons one, right? So <laughs> <laughs> you have 17 so. dragons one and you're in this chat. Shame on you. I was seriously, but yeah. hiccup, hiccup losing his leg. I mean, that was not in the original script or in the books or anywhere. That was, mm. you know, um, everybody being inspired by the film and Jeffrey Katzenberg saying, I think we need to do something radical here. I think we need to mm. kill Toothless. And everybody, what? Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not, not going to kill Toothless. <laughs> but, and then again, the genius problem solvers. Yeah. I think it was Dean and Chris together who said, you know, at one point Tom Owens, who was a, one of the storyboard artists, had suggested, and I believe this is, it may have been somebody else, it may have been 
but I believe it was Tom Owens who had earlier on suggested it would be cool if like Hiccup got a battle score, like he's losing mm. a hand or something. And when Jeffrey suggested that idea of um, Toothless uh, Hiccup losing his leg, I mean uh, Toothless dying, they came up with the idea: what if what if they both are end up being kind of broken characters yeah. and create this mutual symbiosis exactly. of two, you know, two broken parts making a, a, a greater one, right? And kind of that was kind of the idea. And that was, it worked beautifully. And really, I think that's the moment where the movie elevates to something even more memorable. So uh, something, uh, Simon, something that I remember, and I've always been curious that if it had an, uh, an effect on the, uh, the, the final result, uh, I remember, Back in the days when I got to to DreamWorks, the, the 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 film wasn't necessarily in a good place, and then there's been a change of director, and then they came on board. Well, and I what I yeah, what yeah. I remember is that they had an insanely short amount of time to write a completely new story, mm -hmm. and then an insanely short amount of time to animate the entire film compared to most yeah. big production yeah. how much do this hmm. shortage of time like all right that's our shot we're going to execute and we're going to trust mm -hmm. the creative that we work and where everyone is going to get out of the way and we have a couple months to do this uh, this yeah, how, was, how much did was, it play there's that that played a role i mean first the first and for, foremost it was because they only had a certain amount of time and and jeffrey said jeffrey katzenberg said something like um, I want a big villain. I want a big defeat. I want a big battle scene. Or I can't remember. He listed a couple of things that he really needed. And uh, I think Chris and Dean and Alessandro Coloni was the head of story. I think they collectively decided in this time, what we should do is fall back on a known, like what we don't want to do is create a structure that, uh, like we don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel. And so they actually fell back to the structure of, uh, you know, um, Hiccup befriends the, uh, befriends the enemy, the thing that's the most dangerous that everybody fears. And through that friendship, um, you know, kind of betrays his own, but ultimately brings, the, brings sort of a new, uh, a, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing things to the community. So mm -hmm. structurally, they decided, let's go with something classical, but let's make one original thing uh, around that, which is that he breaks him and then fixes him, but the only way he can fix him is by becoming part of him. That was the, that was the original uh, idea. And then everybody thought, that sounds really interesting. And they went, uh, they went away and wrote, uh, and sort of wrote, wrote a first draft of that. And... What was great for us in animation, although heartbreaking, because we had developed Toothless. Gabe Hordos was the surprising animator on Toothless. Gabe Hordos went went away and had developed the, the first version of Toothless, which was the little terrible terror, those green dragons. The Toothless shoots a <laughs> fireball into his face and then explodes. I don't know if you remember that scene. Um, um, by the way, that was animated by Dane Stockner. So, so Toothless was supervised by G Gabe Hordos, who then had to, had to go through the heartbreak of, oh my God, my character is not going to be that guy. It's going to be something else. Um, uh, because one of the big parts was like, you can't make a movie and really give this wish fulfillment and not have hiccups, you know, climb this dragon. So in the books, mm -hmm. he, never, he never flies Toothless. He fly, he, he's, he's too small, right? It's... The books are the runt of the litter of the Vikings befriends the runt of the litter of the dragons. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's a completely different story in a way. And, and that, was, that was a big part of it. And so what we were able to do during this time while the movie was being rewritten, we were able to really develop the characters and help inspire the writing also in the way we were developing those characters. Mm -hmm. And so when we were ready to animate, we, we were able to hit the ground running. There wasn't, you know, like, they, again, amazing problem solvers as they were, they were able to take our characters and put them in the story in the way we had developed them, more or less. I mean, we, again, we redeveloped Hiccup, we redeveloped Toothless, but everything else was kind of there. Yeah. Um, so it helped. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in a way, it helped, and, and we just needed to make the film then. 
Uh, I remember seeing you uh, collaborating uh, a lot with uh, uh, Nico Marley and all the uh, team of character design and basically uh, with a lot of the other department, I would say probably more than most animated feature that I had the chance to, to work on. Uh, how much do you felt it was important for animation to be involved with all those, because uh, you were, uh, of course, with, with story, with character design, with rigging, um, is that something that kind of came natural uh, to you or something that you felt, well, you know, we're in the middle of this also, we don't want to receive characters that we never had the opportunity to yeah. kind of discover ourselves before having to animate them? I mean, you know, to be frank, if you go back to Dragons 1, I don't think the process was that as well developed as that we, you know, most of us are doing now. Mm -hmm. And I think it was still very much, you know, compartmentalized, you know, here's the design, then it gets modeled and then it gets, you know, neutralized. And then you've got a character that you then have to basically go, okay, well, what am I going to do with this? I can never do this with that. Um, I mean, I, I had a really good relation. I mean, I still have a really good relation with Nico Marley and in a way we did, um, we did collaborate well. And, you know, I brought, I mean, you know, like it was, it was, and, and the head of modeling, I think it was Matt Paulson at that time, or I may, may get this wrong, but there were a few really good modelers. And so that process was working better than I, on previous films. And I got heavily involved in the design process. And because we also had to turn new characters around fast, I actually ended up, I mean, Gabe Hordes and myself ended up doing a lot of the design work for Toothless, for the new version of Toothless. And you can kind of see it that, Toothless is a little bit different than the other dragons. Now, Nico did has you know had done a lot of uh, work on Toothless as well, and obviously he's as much to be credited with the design of Toothless uh, mm -hmm. as we are. But sort of this passing things back and forth and us thinking about how the character is going to be in animation helped get there faster because we had to, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so so yeah, I think. Um, a lot of the stuff that happened there and, um, and what was happening on Kung Fu Panda as well a little bit earlier taught us that creating a character for animation has to be a two steps forward, one step back kind of process. You need to be able to get, you know, need to be agile to go into a 3D fast and then, you know, adjust the designs and, and think about how it's going to move. Um, and we did sort of, we did a little bit of that, but it was, I mean, our, our characters were still pretty clunky back then. Dragons mm -hmm. one, we still, we also still animated on the old uh, PDI software emo. Mm -hmm. Only by Dragons two did we have the new software and that changed everything. And we approached it differently. And, you know, Le Leo Sanchez was a, a guy we brought in um, who came off Tangled and he did a lot of this sort of, let's not just sculpt one pose, let's sculpt a stretch and a squash and, and really figure out how the character is going to look. And, and you can see that uh, visually Dragons 2 has a, has a more refined uh, edge than Dragons 1. So we learned a lot in, the, in those, on those films. And of yeah, course, I can we, those, those weren't the only films we were making. We were making other films as well. And we just like passed knowledge uh, amongst yeah. each other. Yeah, I can imagine that from one, and especially as the technology is evolving so uh, rapidly, and as you said, from Emo to Primo, uh, which felt like a software that was out of the 80s, still pretty yeah. powerful. But I mean, as you said, you could literally animate with spreadsheets. Yeah. Um, and then but it, was, it was extremely solid, right? It was extremely yeah. reliable, and that was that was its strength. Like you could you could yeah. really make make films with them and make them. Uh, it, like it would, the pipeline would be really, really reliable. But you go from that to animate pretty much high res model in real time on a Cintiq to everyone. It was just, you know, night and day for yeah. for sure. I mean, I I felt that the, like um, you know, animated and flushed away was fun, but um, you know, Shark Tale and all those films, we were like, I never really felt like I had that much fun animating. It was a bit of a cli climbing a hill. Mm -hmm. You always get the enjoyment of a finished piece of animation that you feel proud of, and then you like you feel like, okay, I managed to get there, and it looks great. But only by Dragons Two did we really feel like, wow, this is this is what animation in three mm. D should feel like. Because now yeah. you have you're basically playing with a, a full res puppet 
um, in some, you know, basic lighting environment. And I mean, you know, it was really amazing. So you're talking about uh, having fun, uh, which I think is a super important part of the the, the, the work for sure. Um, as a as a director, uh, how do how did you get out? Um, uh, you know, how did you get the best out of artists that you were uh, working with? Because that's a big part of being a, you mean a as leader a head of character animation. Production. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's lots of different philosophies about that, and one thing that I, if you have a, if any of you have a head of character animation or a directing animator out there, you're frustrated with. Give them a break because <laughs> they're really hard job. Because <laughs> in a way, it's one of those jobs that you can't be perfect at. Because too many, too many different disciplines. It's like, you know, like you have to be, you have to have a sense of design and be able to do drawovers. You have to have a, uh, you have to be a good actor and be able to uh, and tell people what's missing in their animation and help them get better. And at the same time, you also have to allow them to be themselves and express themselves. So, and then you have, you know, you have the whole production side That's of, right. of delivering a film on time and making people feel like they're they're part of something, you know, that they can be proud of. Like it's there's so much that comes together. <laughs> really, yeah. I mean, directing in a sense is very similar, but but in animation, I I always felt that it's so difficult, it's so dangerous to become a person who just talks about it and goes, yeah, I would drop a few frames right there and then a little more, you know, straight versus curves and a little more stretch. Like you can bullshit your way through that job uh, because anybody can say something about any animation. And, um, and I just never wanted to be that person. And the only way you can, you know, not be that person is to animate, to do a little bit of work. So, I mean, I, I, I always had a shot um, that I was working on. I was trying to work in early in the morning and evenings. And um, and by doing so, you're constantly reminded about how difficult it actually is. Mm -hmm. It's very mm -hmm. easy to point at a piece of animation and say, well, that's missing some weight and that is a little bit you know, uh, clunky and there's... And it's so difficult to um, do, like have your head in the weeds and step out and say, okay, here's... Here's what I need to do, and I think that, uh, that that's one one of the things I believe in very, very strongly. So if you lose if you lose the sense of how difficult it is to get there, even though sometimes I guess as a director it might be a little bit easier because in, as a director you do have to forget how difficult it is in a way because you have to be able to say that's not important for the story. It's a great idea, but it totally doesn't matter for the story. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a little bit of a difference, but as a, as a directing animator, I think you need to be able to feel and uh, empathize with um, um, what somebody's going through. So there's that. And then, I mean, I think to me, uh, you know, I feel very strongly about um, creative leadership is really about creating an, an environment and an atmosphere uh, where people can do their best work. And that is uh, a little bit of the um, a mixture of uh, giving people credit and freedom to produce the work that they really want to do, but at the same time also make sure that they're not falling off. Uh, like if, if all of a sudden everybody's pulling in different directions, that's when it goes wrong. Right? So it's a, yeah. it's a fine balance. It's and, and I think, that, I mean, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating thing uh, to do, and if anybody's interested in the first book to read is uh, Creativity Inc. I think it's it's a phenomenal uh, book about you know creative leadership by um, Ed Catmull. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a, an amazing book that we often uh, reference for uh, for sure. Um, remind me, I, I think you you had your 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 son uh, during uh, the first uh, Alter Train of Dragon, right? Yeah, uh, he was born in 2009, so we were just start, literally just starting to animate. Uh, and then, you know, sort of, we got to make this movie in 12 months or 14 it's months. Crazy, yeah. It's crazy to think that the production babies of How to Train Your Dragon are actually going to high school uh, this year <laughs> yeah, or yeah. next year. But yeah, <laughs> uh, did, it had, yeah, did it have any uh, impact on your uh, uh, pro uh, professional life or art in general or perspective? Did it change anything for, for, for you? I was just really happy that I mean it's really happy times. So I was I was 
enthused and, and and fired up you know great film great directors you know you just had a baby it's just like this this sort of incredible happiness that you're going through um maybe it was also like sorry honey i can't <laughs> i can't put him to bed tonight i really have to work tomorrow there was a bit of like cheating my way through it as well and luckily <laughs> i had um, a wife who's also in animation who just really loved loved being there for for him and and loved that time you know even more than i did so i was really lucky it was a it's a very very creative time and there's actually some ideas that made like witnessing a baby there were a couple of ideas that actually made it into the film uh it wasn't animated by me it was animated by gabe hordos but the idea that toothless mi mimics um uh, hiccup's smile after he offers him like a bar that that so he holds it that smile is is the way my son was trying to imitate <laughs> as long as it's weird like <laughs> yeah what's he doing oh wait he's he smiling doing? right now yeah and that that idea that was one of those ideas but yeah, no, it was very inspiring. It was, it was, it was very like one of the maybe my most creative time in my life. Yeah, yeah, that, that's awesome. You definitely have less hours of sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you find new energy reserve, but yeah. at the same time, yeah. you, you have those little glints that kind of you know inspire creativity. So that's I uh, definitely felt that. Yeah. I just wanted, awesome. to, I, I wanted to jump back really quick on just this topic of leadership because I, I it's it's a it's a topic that I really enjoy talking about. And I think it's an important topic because there's kind of a bit of a division out there on, you know, the different perspectives on this leadership, creative leadership itself. And I do agree the creative, Inc., if you have not, or creativity, Inc., if you've not seen or read that book, you probably should, because it is truly a masterclass, I think on, on exactly this topic, but just to, just to flirt a little bit more with that idea. Like, I mean, it's, it seems clear to me that you are, and I mean, I, I think one of your, one of the quotes that I pulled from some of the, some of the, uh, the videos I've seen you in, you, you, one of the things you said was that, you know, you, what you think creativity is, I'm paraphrasing, of course, so forgive me for my, mm. my, my bad, uh, my bad reproduction here, but cre creativity is something that you're searching for. You know, you're looking for creativity. And as it, and it seems to me that you have this, uh, this, this understanding that that's not something you're doing on your own. You're like a force multiplier. You're trying to enable your team to find their creativity and, and thus allowing them to discover it. And I think the last thing that you said at the end of that quote is, and when you find it, you need to hold on to it. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like that lightning in the bottle. It's because creativity is not really as common as people would think because people have busy schedules and productions are not necessarily aligned with this idea of putting creativity first. So I'm just curious, like this, this delicate balance that you're describing between you know trying to run a tight ship and to make sure people are able to get things done but mm -hmm. also leaving enough room for people to have ownership and to have their own decisions and their own their own ideas boil to the surface like it's what are what is the one thing that you feel like you need to do on a regular basis? like does it just come supernaturally to you or is there like a mantra that you sort of recite in your head that allows you to stay on that that very very tight balancing rope i'm just curious yeah i mean you know, like the, the 12 principles of animation, for example, is something that you learn in yeah. animation school and you, you really like, you train it, you think about it, you know, okay, here I need to, you know, anticipate before I grab something. And, and then eventually you start not thinking about those principles and then eventually you feel them and you can then identify them. And when something's not working, you may fall back to those principles. Um, and, and you even you even go sometimes go like well that principle is bullshit uh, in this particular right. case it's not sure. exactly you don't do this before you do this you actually go like you start like you start yeah. inhabiting it and yeah. I think creative leadership to me is an, or creativity is also something that you start inhabiting it you train your brain to get there um, so for example one of the things I I often do and I still do that is like you pause. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let me let me use an example. Um, to me, creativity or creating something uh, very, um, you know, sort of new or fresh or interesting or uh, communicative, entertaining is something that you. It's a journey you have to get there, and mm -hmm. it to me, it's sort of entering a black room, a dark room where you know there's something there, and you start yeah. little by little hanging lights, right. and yeah. then you start. Like, once you have three lights, you start judging it. Oh, okay, that that's nicer if it's a little higher, and you you start building out from that. So there are those people, uh, you know, of the James Baxters. Although I've never had this conversation with him. Who are just gonna sit down and they just be like they like they they can just produce that 
kind of genius. They see it in front of their eyes, which mm. I, maybe James will say, no, that's not what I do. But <laughs> I, I, to me, as the, as yeah. the viewer, I go like, oh, well, James just sits down and does something that's amazing. That's what it seems like, yeah. <laughs> that's what it seems like. But for me, it's a little bit like I do these checkpoints where I, like one of the things I definitely do is when I watch a, a, a sequence and I have my shot in there, I watch the layout, watch the storyboard, then I close my eyes, I listen to the scene, I listen to the rhythm, and whatever comes to my mind then is the most obvious thing that I will then you know, really record and I picture what the scene will look like. And then I put that idea aside because that's my fallback idea. And then I question myself and say, what are, okay, I'm going to come up with 10 other ways of solving this, this particular creative mm. puzzle. And I, you can do that for writing, you can do that for storyboarding, yeah. you can do that for animation. And you create a list of all the other things you could do. And once you have that list of 10 things, you know, like, ah, he could be um, picking his nose, he could be turning around and walking back, he could be, instead of going to grab for it, he, uh, you know, like, whatever, all the 10 things with which you can grab things. And you compare all those ideas to the, to the original idea you had, and you say, is this telling the story as well as the other one, which is the obvious one, and, and is it, or is it more original and it does the job of telling right. the story? And likely you're going to end up with some combination of one of your new ideas that you forced yourself to come up with with the original uh, idea that feels natural, the most natural. Right. So I think, like, I think pausing to, again, tap around the dark room and say, well, what light bulbs over here and what could I find back here? And as you're walking through this room, you start seeing the shape of it and you start right. building mm -hmm. out of it. And that, I think, and this is, I'm not sure, like if I compared myself, my brain, the way my brain works and the way it's shaped from my childhood through my, I mean, I, I grew up in a pretty creative environment you know, um, with my brothers and my, 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 my father and my mom, like they're all relatively creative people. Is that me just like, is my brain filling in those ga gaps because of how my brain is shaped or is it really the mm -hmm. work that I do to get there? And I think it's probably a little yeah, combination of that. Yeah. Like you, you need to do this exercise with somebody who is completely not creative and has worked in with spreadsheets all their lives. Although I hear people with, really colorful spreadsheets are also very creative. I, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it's that, yeah. it's that idea of um, what does your brain give you kind of naturally, like people who have a great sense of humor, they're naturally maybe funnier. But I believe that even people who are not necessarily funny can get themselves to be funny to a degree, right? right. So it's the same thing here. I think you can get yourself to, uh, to some level of creativity. How do you scale that to a team though? Like, how do you mobilize? Cause I mean, that seems like the way you think, but how do you yeah. then, cause I mean, I think that like, I feel like when I've, when I've been on teams in the past where that it's like this very collaborative and very electric and the idea that you have a bunch of those, especially if you have some, some of those special, um, special lightning rods in the, in the team that are kind of like those, those um, uh, almost signal repeaters, like, you know what I mean? Like they're mm -hmm. in a room and it makes everyone feel more safe to like mm -hmm. throw the radical ideas out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think you were talking about Sanders is a little bit like this, right? Is like mm -hmm. just yeah. radically, like it's it's okay yeah. to, add, to talk about something that's totally off the wall and crazy. And what that does is it sort of, it, it opens up this flow, this like this lubricant mm -hmm. to the to the brainstorming. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how do you, how do you make it feel like that that's, how do you get the team to embrace that sort of spirit? Of, of... Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, of course, you need to have individual conversations with everybody. You need to understand each person yeah. and what they want, where they want to be, how they see themselves, um, what's interesting to them, and you need to really listen. Yeah. And you need to make an effort, a visible effort, to give those people what they want. But you need to help them guide. You need to guide them onto a path that works for you as the creative right. leader, right? I mean, right. of course, uh, um, you know, everybody wants the, the you know, 20-second close-up uh, 
where they, you know, voiced by Anthony Hopkins, and then that's going to be their main. Like everybody thinks about their real. Yeah, their everybody mindset. thinks about their real and the Annie Awards, and I care yeah. about I, neither of them. And yeah. I be, I'm pretty yeah. frank about about. Yeah. I mean, I love the Annie Awards. Don't get me wrong. Sure. I love what they do to their community, but, but that's like when I'm motivation. on a film, yeah. that's the last thing I worry about. I don't yeah. worry about your real. I don't want to worry about your uh, Annie Award, and I'm telling you this straight. Yeah. But what I worry about is something that you want to do and you like I want you to tell me which way you want to go and where you want to evolve and I want to really listen to that and help people um, you know get better and get into that direction as best as I can because I mean yeah. there's only so much I can do yeah and yeah. and giving people that that environment where they can do uh, where can they, they can grow in the way they want to grow not in the way I want them want right. them to grow right got it um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, is creating an environment. Like one of the things I really believe in is that, and I function like that. Uh, I'm definitely a person who's going to give you ideas, mm. but I also know that seven of those 10 <laughs> ideas are probably, you know, lame <laughs> or average. But, but ideas. if I, if I stop by idea one yeah, or idea exactly. two, because I feel like somebody just, you know, rolls his eyes at my relatively bad idea that wasn't yeah. completely thought through. Yeah. You're never going to get to that, like because right. I, I know that out of one of those ten ideas, one or two of them will be really good. Yeah, it's like it required mm. those seven mediocre yeah. ideas to get you to need, the good you, ones. Exactly, right? you need to yeah. get and and you. I mean, I've seen this so many times, partic particularly in, if you're in a room with really cr really talented people, like let's say Dean DeBlois or Chris Sanders. Yeah, they will allow you to throw out those ideas. Yeah, because they get and it. and then they will go. Yeah, and you know what? That creates a ripple effect on this. But what I like about your idea is this yeah. thing. Yeah, and maybe we can integrate it there in a different way. Totally. And they turn like they turn your idea into something really brilliant. And I've <laughs> mm -hmm. seen that happen so many times. So uh, I, I think the worst thing a leader can do is. Yeah to somehow stifle that, yeah. that failing, the, yeah. the, the, the procedure of failing, the process mm -hmm. of failing, um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and not allow that to happen. Man, that's so refreshing to hear you say that. Yeah, but, that, you know, that, the really important thing is that one of, the, one of the dangerous things about doing this is that you're in a room and that it, the only the, the loudest voices are heard. Mm -hmm. like that's one of the things, like, a lot of really creative people, and like Nico Marley is one of those great examples, He's a very introverted person, like you know, and has has it sort of an, an interesting intelligence um, that you know if you if you take those people and you put them in a big room, uh, they will never say anything, but mm -hmm. they'll all of a sudden at the end they walk out of the room and they'll show you a little drawing and, and say, <laughs> maybe something like this, and you have to make sure that you get those ideas because That's awesome. uh, there's a lot of people that are more introverted. Or, yeah afraid of big rooms and it's not always the loudest voices mm. Uh, mm. or the best salesmen that that will tell you the best ideas a lot of them will but i think you have to really get it from everywhere and you have to be willing to hear it from everywhere so yeah. oh, sorry last point i'm gonna make is i'm very passionate about this is the <laughs> idea of um contrarian point of views right uh a you need to allow people to check your point of views but through contrarian points of views and need to allow them to voice them. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, you might, might choose sometimes it might be better to let's, let's have coffee together and you tell me about it rather than, you know, <laughs> say it out in the room. Uh, if everybody's already working in the direction somebody tells you to go the other way. Um, and, uh, and you also need to actually put people together who see it a little bit differently. And sometimes, one of the things you want to do is that, okay, I see these more introverted people who want to take the, the ideas in this way, and I see these more maybe extroverted people who want to take the movie in this way. Let's put them together and have them be mm. creative in their own ways or assign yeah. them to, to give them certain things to, to work on that they can own. Like, like, that, like that's really good. Like that's like a good sports team who all of yeah, a sudden, a like good one, one's a striker, the other one's a defender, yeah. and the other one's a midfielder. And, yeah. and make sure that they can work together. That's something yeah. I believe in very strongly too. That's so there's awesome. there's a lot of aspects to it. Um, I, mm -hmm. One of the principles I live by is that you you as a leader should not aim for um, greatness. You should aim for the for for the next thing to be better than the last. 
however b- bad the previous thing was, the next thing just needs to be a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And you find a path that's always upwards. If you aim for perfection up front, you're likely going to kill your yeah. crew. Yeah. yeah, so it's almost making this perfection, this fear in front of you that's going to st- stop yourself. Yeah. And because that's one of the things we're often saying when we were uh, brainstorming is like, okay, guys, let's put all the bad ideas on the table. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I can see my bad ideas. Okay. And then that's you have great. a lot of bad ideas. And at some point, like, oh, that's not as bad as the others. And you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thread in this direction, and by the end, I think we have something pretty original here. Okay, let's try it out. I mean, but, I, I, yeah. for me, also applies to um, as a let's say a head of character animation or a supervising animator. It's not my job to aim for perfection. It's my job to make you better. It's your job to aim for perfection. It's the animator's mm. job to aim for perfection, and I'll tell them, you know what. This is really great. I think it's time to move on to the next one. Let's leave that up behind. If it really doesn't work, we can come back to it, whatever. Like it, 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 that I see this way too often where it's the supervisors who want the perfection yeah. and their crew mm-hmm. try to live up to it. When in yeah. fact, that's not great leadership. You're, you're in fact yeah. telling them constantly they're not good enough. Yeah. And if, you, if you're put in that position, you have to make them feel like they can do they can do better but you have to have it you know it's their own it's their own thing to own it's not your thing to you have to help them get better but mm-hmm. not by telling them this is wrong that's wrong that's wrong that's wrong by yeah. telling them maybe you could try something like this or why don't you go away and think about this part because i feel like it's lacking this and then 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 i think that's how you get people to become better animators yeah it's, it's more tra- like it's a, it's a path a trajectory it's more like managing the environment, and then you 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 give space for for mm-hmm. uh, your, your team yeah. members to kind of thrive yeah. in uh, in it. Um, I see time flying by, and I know that we're going to go to uh, some uh, question after that. After twenty one years leaving DreamWorks, um, I'm assuming that there was there might have been a fair amount of uh, insecurity in this mm-hmm. uh, decision or fear of the unknown or because I mean it's it's a pretty amazing place to 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 be working yeah. uh, what was the, the 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 mindset when you uh, made that uh, decision yeah I mean you know I, I dragons three was you know came to a conclusion and and you know we knew that um, that that the band was gonna get split up you know like there was no way we're gonna do another one and um and for me, it was like, you know, the things that were, DreamWorks was kind of in a, you know, it had just been sold to Universal, leadership had changed, um, you know, it was a little bit in a, in a, in a phase of reconstruction and not, not very few things got greenlit. And out of the projects that, I mean, first of all, I couldn't see myself going on to do a head of character animation on any of the movies that were there because I felt like it would have, it would have probably not been a satisfying experience and therefore I would probably not have done a great job at it. So I wasn't, I wasn't that interested in, I was really, I had done some directing on the TV show between Dragon 2 and Dragon 3 and I really caught the bug and I was really interested in that shape and storyboarding and, and sort of looking at, you know, telling stories on, on sort of a more holistic level. So they had, you know, offered me uh, one project that I felt like it was actually a Dragon's project. And I just said, like, I'm just going to ruin it. I, you know, Dean's not going to be there. And like, it's really his baby now. And for me to direct that felt wrong. And plus, again, 12 years of Dragons was enough. You know? <laughs> and, and so I, I, I took the plunge and said, look, I mean, I want to, I'm happy to come back to DreamWorks when the right thing is there, but my, why don't I take a break and take a time out and see other projects yeah. that I could possibly do. And so came the big moment when I left um, and it was really difficult, I have to say. It was difficult to, because immediately, even though you tell yourself, oh, something will come along, you can just storyboard, mm. you can you know, consult. And you know, I took some consulting jobs but it's still like I wanted to direct and that is always I mean and anybody who's making the jump from being a, a modeler to being an animator or animated to being a, a production designer like it's always not really welcomed 
because they know what you're good at and they know what your value is at and you're not exactly saying well i'm going to go back and i'm going to direct uh, a short film for myself on paid um you know that i mean as much as that as much as it sounds really exciting i mean i had a family and i needed a job <laughs> i needed to work mm -hmm. um so uh, so that was really unsettling and and i i took my projects around i had a few projects that i was i was um you know developing and um you know, you, you, you obviously, you, you don't, it doesn't go as smoothly as you think because you think that, yeah, somebody's just going to take it and then give me the money and find the screenwriter for me to take it and make it great. And that didn't happen. Uh, or at least not yet. I mean, there's some, some of the, I, I have several projects that I'm developing, working with different people. And, and it took about a year um, for some of those projects to actually finally get going. Hmm. So I I'm still working on multi you know one of the one of the you know one was a mo I mean uh, it was a Love Death and Robots episode that I directed that's coming out on May fourteenth okay. uh, that was awesome. that was you know a real learning experience and I have a, um, another two projects I can't really talk about one is uh, in you know in the second half of production and the other one's a feature that I'm directing and. Um, and it's going really well. It's really so exciting, this, actually. This directing of the uh, Love, Death, and, uh, and Robots, how was the experience compared to what you... Because you always have in your head, OK, directing is going to be like this, this, and this, based mm -hmm. on the other directors that you work with, based on your own you know, imagination of how, how... How was the real experience compared to how you thought that, that it would be? Um, you know what I, find, I found, I mean, I had an idea from what directing would be on the television side, right? Doing episodes for uh, the Dragon TV show. And what I liked about it, like directing for television was, here's a script. Uh, you have some notes? Yeah, I got some notes. Okay, I'll fix them by 4 p.m. Go, <laughs> go into preparing it for three days and then launching board artists next Monday, right? And directing this feature is like, it's a completely different yeah. um, feeling. It's the same process. You do the same, like you go from production design to storyboarding yeah. to, you know, all, it's all the same. Like um, uh, it's just, it's a, because, yeah. it, because of its length and its yeah. uh, financial means, it has a different feeling. Love, Death and Robots was great because I got to storyboard the whole thing myself and do a first pass edit myself. Um, I'm probably not supposed to talk about any of it, but <laughs> my name and Love, Death and Robot season two is out. So that's all I really can say. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so, so like Love, Death and Robots was a completely different experience working with different, like even working between television, uh, you know, like a high end episode, like Love, Death and Robots, which doesn't feel like television. It feels like, um, you know, real kind of high end, you know, short film project. And then doing a feature that in itself is just different. Um, mm -hmm. But the the one th I guess the one thing that I learned the most about was what it takes to get a project off off the ground. You know, the, uh, you know, from pitching it to packaging it to you know being in the sort of selling process with a with a studio, a buyer, and what it takes to be made and like all those things are incredibly complex and they also vary from project to project mm -hmm. and like and i always is have that... assumed working at dreamers just sorry quickly just working at dreamers uh, you know my vision was always oh you have a great idea great concept you pitch it with a two yeah. three page outline and and a good pitch and they're gonna go yeah we love it we want to we want to develop it here go to this area with these mm -hmm. people and develop yeah. it yeah. and then Here's come the back team. for come back for a green light pitch and if we you know say it's greenlit you go you 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 know you get stages of 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 like crewing up and then you're going to make it well outside of dreamworks it doesn't really work like that i mean <laughs> if, if you make a project on the outside you have you have to you know find ways to package it and to make it um you know for a studio not to be able to refuse your project because it's so great it's so well packaged and uh, and you know pitching it pitching something to Netflix versus pitching something to Paramount or or DreamWorks, each one of those are, are different. They're looking for different things. They might 
take different, you know, um, they prefer different types of projects, different packages, and, uh, you know, some like the writers attached and others don't. Like, it, it's, it varies a great deal, and that's a really murky environment to be in. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where I was, and as you can see, my brain still... Uh, you know, fuming from all that. <laughs> but I managed. I mean, I managed to. I managed to get some stuff off the ground, which is really rewarding. When when things finally get going, it's extremely rewarding. And and is it something that you ended up, you know, understanding, getting used to it, and uh, enjoying a, a little bit of selling a project, or is it part of the process that you would rather outsource or leave I'm, to? Uh, I mean, one else? one thing I've learned is that I'd rather be in that process with other people it's really it's a really hard thing to do by yourself i think you have to be a writer to be able to take a project and develop it and then sell it as a director um, you know again my mother tongue clearly is not english and uh and you know to pitch a project i mean you have to have a name like i'm sure um Guillermo del Toro can have an idea and say wouldn't it be great to make uh, the great escape with chicken And please can, take our money you yeah. know what i mean like that maybe but <laughs> when you're when you're um and I, i also by the way i feel i felt a little bit like the some of the studios were a little burnt with heads of animation becoming directors because um you know because maybe in their minds we're not inherently story people um mm. even though I, i disagree with that but mm. Uh, I can see why some of them felt that way. So that made it also hard. Like if I just come in and say, here's my project, here's my idea. And I've learned, you know, like together with some other people, whether it's a, a, a development studio or a writer, like that makes it a lot easier. Pairing up with people that are have similar interests and, and complement you makes your, um, makes your pitch generally a much, much stronger. Hmm. Awesome. So Sorry, I, I know I was tangenting on, I don't know if anybody's interested in this, but uh, that's definitely the experience I've, I've gone through over the last two years. And no, I think it's eye opening. I think it's super interesting because it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's this sort of the unknown of just putting yourself out there, right? Like you, you have to figure it out. Like you, you were successful, extremely successful making movies in the model and the framework that is DreamWorks. But then you'd remove yourself from that equation. And then all these things that just happen automatically, you kind of needed to figure out. It's like, oh man. So this thing that just happened, like there's a, you know, like just automatically with me just asking for it. I got it at DreamWorks. Now you need to be thinking about that thing and then find a way of getting that thing in order to make it all go. Like, I mean, like, did you partner up? Or like, so it makes it sound like you did all this pitching completely on your own. So you did the writing and all of, all of the, all that pitch work was all completely generated by yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, I, oh, wow. I, 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 um, it was a bit of both, um, you know, because, you know, I started, you know, obviously people started knowing that I was out there and, you know, some people approached me, you know, would you be interested in helping me take this? And, uh, you know, I was in a sense then became an asset in their pro project that they could pitch and with, with me attached would help them. And I did, the, I did the same where I was starting, started taking other people and bringing other people into um, certain ideas. But my very first thing coming out of DreamWorks was I had this one project that I'm still working on that I heavily believe will, will get made at some point, um, which is based on, a, on an, an, an indie video game that I had optioned the rights to. Oh, interesting. And, uh, and I just you know sat down, developed an, uh, an, an outline And and went out with a keynote and and some and like a little poster printed yeah. on a on a on a board and went out there and hit up all my contacts and all the studios. So I didn't even do it with a an agent or a manager. Wow. And um and I, I got it, I got in everywhere I wanted to and but I also felt like it was it was a very it's a very ambitious project. I felt like Mm, you alone, never directed, never written a project, you're preaching as a project, that's a big, big ask. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, it's some of them didn't like the project and others, you know, I get relatively good feedback. So I felt like this, 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 this could work. This could, man, yeah. was hopeful all this time. And somehow mm -hmm. that phone call never came. Interesting. I had some people who said, well, when you have a writer, let's please bring it back because we're really interested, but we just don't, we cannot, you know, right. get commit to this or there was lots of reasons and you know um, and um and i think that uh you know 
that that was definitely one of the things that like it was a real big learning experience. And part of what I said set out I was going to do it. I just want to be in a in a room pitching a project and see what it feels like right. out there in the world. <laughs> and in this process, you know, the studios like, in a way I also used it to be um, sort of introduced to studios uh, as a director. And that then got some things going, some other projects that and I got called in for. And, uh, and I ended up developing about three or four projects um, and, and two of which are, you know, moving. And, and so, yeah, so one, one actually is a, a series that's going to be released. Uh, it's not been announced yet. It's going to be re released at Halloween this year. So yeah, and then and then my, my biggest experience in learning experience in all this was that all my career I was working on one project at a time, and all of a sudden yeah. I'm working on three <laughs> four projects at the same time, and sometimes you have weeks where you can't get to yeah. bed, and other weeks like you're waiting for the next thing to happen, and yeah. that's the hard part uh, about yeah. it. Yeah. Am I assuming that a lot of that juggling is happening because you don't know if one of them are going to get green? You can't just wait for this one thing. You're waiting for a phone call. So they're like, okay, well, then start making another so, thing. And like, hopefully something's going to go, right? And then they I all had, go at the same time. I had right? several, several offers coming along along the way to for really interesting projects um, that I, I think I would have taken had I known that this other thing was going to take another six months to get mm -hmm. to a green light. Right, you know, yeah, and and I, I turned it down because like so so that is actually a really hard part of it, where all of a sudden you go like, which horse do I bet on? Yeah, and, that's it. And generally you bet on the wrong horse because that's the one that you're most passionate about, yeah, and that's course. the one that least likely going to get <laughs> uh, made. Of course, <laughs> yes. If it, if yeah, it would be boring if it was out the other way around. I think it's just the universe's way of sort of keeping it interesting for you, probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, David, should we transition to questions before we're out of time, or do you have another thing you wanted to ask first? I've a hundred thing, but yeah, know, we have too. It's 24 crazy. minutes left. You know, so let's um, jump yeah, into uh, the question. JD had a question that I'm yeah, interested and, in asking. And I, um, I, just really quickly too, I just wanted to also say that Sir Way just showed up in the audience and he's also saying hi. Sir Way, nice to see yeah, you. I did not see you. I know you're there. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to see your, your letters. It's nice <laughs> and your to little, see your, your, little your names, your little uh, <laughs> emojis. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, so... so um, JD's question, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Honestly, there's no real clear answer of how you break into, um, you know, like how you break into the industry Actually, as Simon, a director. Let yeah. me just paraphrase the question just because maybe not right. everybody sees the chat like you oh, see yeah, it, because it depends what platform they're on. So essentially, JD is asking, um, um, like he said, he's, he's you know, interested in, in directing in, um, animated movies and, and besides story and directing studies, making short, oh, sorry, I'm interested in directing animated movies um, and, um, and besides story and directing studies, making shorts, et cetera, what else would you recommend the, to break into that field based on your experience? Like, how do you make that leap, which you've obviously clearly made? You're, you've you've been directing animation and then that, you know, to, to go from that to like fully directing films. That's yeah, amazing. he's on the other side now. Yeah, it depends it, like, a little bit on, on who you are, what level you're at. And yeah. like, you know, I mean, I definitely used my head of character animation uh, experience as leverage mm -hmm. And that helped me open up a lot of doors. So in a way, I, I did feel there was a little bit of interest, you know, a little bit of like, oh, yeah. maybe it could be one that could pull it off. Um, uh, so so that so there's 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 that. Uh, like if you're if you feel like you have never really proven in the industry that you've done story or you know, I've done a, a, a project that, you know, feels like, like, for example, if you get nominated for an Oscar um, or, uh, or even an Annie Award or something that can help you open some doors, like some of that can help. But my feeling is that um, you have multiple ways to break in, but you got to do it and you have to... Um, like you, it's like a plant. You have to, you know, water it constantly and figure out and listen to the feedback that you're getting and see how you can kind of shape it. I think the one thing that's possible but less likely is that you have this project and you wrote it and you develop it, particularly when it's a feature or a series or something pretty big, and you think this is exactly what it's going to be. It's this weird contradiction that's out there. It's like where they expect you to have a vision and tell them exactly what it's going to be. 
But at the same time, you also tell them that I want this to be exactly what you want to be in order to get made. <laughs> and, and if you do one or, or just the other, it's not going to work. Because if you come in, it's like, this is exactly the project I want. And you've, you know, you're not Alberto Mielgo or somebody who's like, you know, blown people's minds. Um, and, and they know what they're going to get is you. Um, if you don't have that kind of name, if you come in with that strong experience, um, they're going to feel like you're not going to be an easy collaborator. And mm -hmm. who are you anyways to bring that? And if you're the person who's going to pitch something, well, I thought about something with unicorns and mermaids and something, <laughs> but I want it to be what you want it to be. They're not going to, they're not going to do it either. So you have to kind of figure out a way to present that project as a, um, as a, as a basic idea that that can be springboarded off in a way, a pitch is a tease is you tell them you want to make them uh, fill in the gaps themselves, the version that they want to see, but you want to tease yeah. them enough in mm -hmm. all the ideas that you're bringing. So that's one of the things. Um, I think the easiest way to get into the industry as a director, I think is probably by um, you know breaking into something smaller and then growing from there, like being a, 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 an episode director on a series or, um, I mean, story artists definitely have an easier way to break mm -hmm. into directing because they, they generally can pitch really well oh, and, yeah. and, and have lots, like have thought about lots of story ideas and, um, and you know, have sort of course studied story structure. And in a way, everybody assumes that if you're a story artist, you understand story structure, which is not necessarily the case. But yeah, so so store, the storyboarding path is a good path. Then making a short film, and then you know getting it getting it into festivals and getting it maybe nominated or shortlisted to and uh, uh, some some big prize will help you because that then then you can get into the doors of managers. Ma a manager can definitely get like a manager can get you a directing job on a TV show from which you then can evolve um, into bigger and greater things. I think the easiest way, which is very hard, is to be inside a studio like DreamWorks, Disney, mm -hmm. or Sony, or something like that, be in the story path, develop your short film inside a studio like that, get it made, and then sort of find your way to directing. But. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I see right now is happening is actually really talented people and talented directors because there's so much um, that's being made out there. There's a lot of opportunities in the smaller project, like, I mean, uh, like a great uh, commercial or, um, you know, like short, short subjects, like cinematics for games. And like, there's a lot of great, if you, if you have, I mean, your experience, uh, JD, and, and what you have to show in the talent you, you clearly have proven, I think you are going to be able to find your way into some of these conversations. And so, I mean, like for you, for example, I would recommend maybe finding, um, like getting some calls with managers um, that can help like present you and like pair you up with projects. I mean, ideally, you find writers um, that are also sort of at the same level as you are, and you present projects together. And that, I think that there you have a lot of chance, particularly with the streamers. You know, they're looking for content left and right. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we had uh, uh, another question. I feel that was pretty uh, interesting. It's coming back to our discussion about uh, leadership. Um, some of the common tra uh, uh, traits uh, that you've noticed uh, in great team members and what are some of the pitfalls, something you'd advise beginners to look out for. Um, you know, uh, it's, as you, uh, as you said, it's a team that brings a uh, project to, together. Uh, what would you say are the main three, um, threats, uh, threats uh, um, of great team members? Um, I mean, uh, we actually had a little chat early on, and maybe I should just say some, something we said um, before, which I think is something I believe in, is that there's two types of animators. I mean, as I speak for animators, and story artists are probably the same. There's mm -hmm. two types of animators. There's the animator who um, thinks that he's, he's really talented and thinks he's really good, and then compares themselves 
to whatever the next level is up, whether it's a lead animator or a supervising animator, and they compare themselves to the worst uh, of those mm -hmm. and say, I'm better than that person, therefore I should be promoted because I'm better than that person. And then there's those animators, uh, those, those, those people who compare themselves to the best and realize how much is missing to be there. And, but don't, but be inspired by that. And, and in a way, I feel like there's, and, and I see this in sport too. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was big into sports growing up and I still am. Like I always, I was very competitive, but I was competitive with, with, with my own abilities. Like I wanted to be better than I was the last time. And I wanted to, even that meant like I'm still, you know, this much off from the best in my team or my, the sport that I was playing. And, and I think that's very, it's a very healthy way of looking at it. It's like, you gotta, you gotta aim for those people that are at the very top and be inspired by them and not be in competition to the people left and right of you. Those should help you get better because they're, they're solving the same problems you are. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think is, um, it's, you know, you just have to, you know, be on a trajectory, like see yourself get better. And, and I, I love like diving into particular problems and learn like to be really good at those things. And once you're good at that thing, then learn the next um, because it's overwhelming. Like, I, I mean, I always say animation in itself is not very difficult because it's only really uh, a few key things you need to know. It's doing all those things at the same time and not get lost in them. Mm. Um, is the hard part and doing it under a deadline and doing it with notes and doing it with, you know, people chiming in and, and people were really successful. They, they, they managed to kind of play, uh, play well at all those things, like to hold on to what they really want to do, but take notes well. And, um, you, you have to kind of be nice and not so nice in this game. Like if you're too nice and you just do everything and everybody's always telling you, and you kind of lose what you wanted to do and you then you just kind of like you just kind of get washed from one thing to the other so i think you need to have your own motivation in each scene like okay they tell me that i need to do this but what i'm really in, interested in is i'm gonna in this shot i'm gonna create really dynamic hand poses and i'm gonna go online i'm gonna research all the great draftsmen who created great hand poses in their shots and i'm gonna learn how to do that in the shot and everything else about it, I'm going to follow exactly what I'm being guided to do. And the next thing, you challenge yourself to something else. And little by little, you start doing things better than the people uh, who supervise you uh, or, or want to guide you in this. And you start, like, you start getting things um, assigned to you that they know you're going to do a great job at. And then you're going to continue them. And then you just have to continue to kind of voice interest in learning to be good at multiple things and continue to grow in all these areas and eventually i think that'll uh, I, I believe in the this idea that positivity washes you up and negativity washes you down in the process mm. so yeah. one of the and this is the hardest part is you have to maintain positive a positive attitude towards the work you're doing you have to be enthusiastic about it and if you lose that change it like find a different way go somewhere else or or because negativity eventually will get you down you, yeah. so you have to stay positive and hopeful and and you you're going to inevitably wash up negativity by wash up i mean get better and and ultimately get into positions where you really want to be and where you can really express your creativity i was going to say yeah. that negativity is sort of a slippery slope too because i think once you start down that path try like it is i've seen i've seen really talented people just get crushed by it you know they just they, yeah. they lose that that spark of like being hungry to get better and and to to be enthusiastic about improving themselves and their craft and then mm -hmm. they just it just it just eats them alive and it, uh, it doesn't end well usually yeah, if you want, yeah. You want it to doesn't it, it generally doesn't and, and it's hard i mean i've i've had periods of like frustration and and you just kind of have to slap yourself out of it you mm -hmm. really do yeah yeah, that's definitely one of the challenge of being a professional artist or creator or yeah. however, you know, whatever what happens, you grind forward, you're, you need to show up the, the, the next day and, you know, you need to move forward no, no, uh, no matter what. And, you know, like, how, 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 you know, so often you're on a project, you're not that 
excited about and you you got to find something in there that's interesting to you because that that's what it means to be a pro right mm -hmm. you find something to make it special for yourself yeah while also satisfying all the needs of the production and every i, I mean if you do well if you do well at that eventually you're going to end up you're going to actually be able to kind of steer your career a little bit into the into the areas where you really want to be in movies projects you can you can be at because then you're you're so good and you can show that work that you can pick and choose a little bit and and that's when 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 it becomes really really fun you know it's funny i've kind of detected a bit of a theme during this conversation and it's almost like what we're saying is to be a really good animator you need to be a perfectionist but someone who embraces failure and to be a, an animation supervisor you need to be an assertive uh visionary who's also extremely collaborative it's like walking enigmas like animators and animation supervisors <laughs> yeah. they need to find that like you said earlier it's like there's a fine balance to being really good at these things and you do need to embrace those kind of both sides of the spectrum otherwise you it's it's like you'll find this sort of unbalance or imbalance to the whole process yeah it's funny yeah another way yeah. of looking at it another way of the way i'm looking at it is like um like I, I kind of developed this thing. Like I, I'm, I'm, I have very strong opinions about what I think is work, works and what doesn't. What's interesting, what's not interesting, and I will voice those. But I will mm. always voice it in um, in a way that is, um, it sort of goes back to like improv, right? Yes, yeah. and this kind yes. of idea that, yeah. like, but, but in a way, I also noticed like I. I was very quickly telling people, like, if you don't want my opinion, don't invite me to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can do that, of course, when you're in a leadership position. Uh, yeah. It's a bit harder as an animator, but I, I, <laughs> I, I mean, that particip the, 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 the desire to participate and help make things, um, yeah. push things forward while including that other people might not see it the same way and my, while yeah. ac accepting that. But this idea of, share your opinion, like voice it, because the more you share your opinion, the more you shape your opinion. And being a good animator is a lot about opinions because you look at your work and you make decisions over, oh, yeah. uh, this is good and this is not good, this is right and this is not right, this feels better th than that. It's all opinion, right? So oh, yeah. totally. shaping it, if you don't have an opinion about what it is, then you don't know what the difference between good and bad is, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, one of one of the things I, I, I I've encountered going from one um, sort of uh, aspect of being in animation to the other, like from animation to story to you know character design to directing, is um, only when you're a real expert do you understand when somebody says, "I think that person's really talented." And you go, uh, "No, like." you just made a bouncing ball like that's not <laughs> yet <laughs> you know like like it's only when you're an expert and when you have shaped your opinion that you can tell the difference between what's good and yeah. what's great yeah, and the spectrum it's of light. different the difference between good and great is yeah. where uh you know particularly in the big studios where you really make the difference Absolutely. and it's the part that's expensive because it's the part you pay the big box oh, yeah. for for talent oh, yeah, it's always. the part where all of a sudden <clears throat> instead of you know, um, 10 feet a week, you do it at three feet a week or four feet a week, you yeah. know, like that's, and that's, I think is where your, where your opinion matters. And that's yeah. what you got to do is you got to work on shaping your opinion about something. Yeah. Like these productions, <laughs> they live in the very painful, the very painful part of the curve when, when, when mapping out the law of diminishing returns, that's, yeah. that, that yeah, yeah, it's exactly, is where, it's where these productions live. <laughs> um, so I have another question here uh, from Christabella 99. This didn't come in from chat. I think it might've come in from uh, Facebook or some other place. Uh, but I have it here on a sheet. Uh, and it was a question specifically about your past, uh, transition from 2d to 3d. Like, you know, what was that like for you, you know, making that transition? And like, do you have any tips for, cause I mean, I still see people that are still learning it cause they're so romantically attached to, to the, to, to 2d animation. And I get it. I came from 2d animation myself and I, and I miss it yeah. tremendously. I guess, I guess the question question i mean not, not being able to ask them specifically i get I, I feel like what they're asking is do you have any tips like how can you how can that process be made a little easier what, what's a good mindset to transition in your mind from 2d space to a 3d space what, what are the things to look out for i mean the first thing is there's tremendous opportunities uh as a 3d animator not not, not just in terms of job but in terms of the um creative expression because you have so much control 
and and you know getting over the hurdle of of making this new bicycle that you're riding as comfortable as the previous one is the hard part yeah. but once you're on the other side of it you will actually be a better 3d animator because you were a 2d animator oh, yeah. because you're thinking about silhouettes and design and harmony and 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 line and all that stuff um i i think the biggest tip is to both hold on to your process but also allow a new process to develop um <laughs> you know I, I i still think if you're a 2d animator going into 3d you want to start with keyframes you want to keep it in step you want to shape your performance but don't stay in it for too long because eventually you want to see what it looks like in 3d i mean and that's the hardest moment. I mean, it's still the hardest moment as a, as a 3D animator is that when you go from your keyframes to oh. watching it be in between by the computer. <laughs> I mean, I, I, when I work, and, and most people probably do that, they they do both. I mean, I, I watched it in Spline and pretty soon so I can get a sense of the, the yeah. overall timing. Mm -hmm. And then I go back into step and shape my keyframes. Yeah. Um, so I think... I guess what I'm saying is holding on to your process, which is uh, keyframe to breakdowns and shaping your performance through those storytelling beats is still the way to go. But you may eventually pretty quickly start thinking about how to, comp how, how to, what you need to do in order to get the computer yeah. out of your performance, right? So that it doesn't feel like a computer animation. So the what and but, why stays yeah. the same, but you're you're kind of coming up with me possibly with another another how, right? It's like you're doing it differently, but you're still doing the same yeah. things with the same rationale as you might have done before. I yeah. did, I think we just found another enigma, another oxymoron when it, we, we can apply it to animation. Yeah. Hold on to who you are, your true self. It's, but it's be able to that, evolve yeah. to the next level. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> This all of Simon guy's breaking my brain. He's telling me to do. I two do things think actually, completely... it's it's what what an artist's journey is. I like totally you have agree to with look. You. you have to look at your uh, yes, you're a professional. And yes, you're a technician, and we're, we're not artists per se. Um, I mean, like in the way, like for example, we German speakers understand the term artist. It's really some an artist, somebody who creates his own art. And then goes out and sells it, you know. <laughs> um, and we're in that sense, we're much more technicians and craftsmen. But mm. but there's still an art in it, and the art is a journey of discovery and evolution, right? Uh, so if you feel like you're just doing the same thing over and over, you kind of you you lose that that sort of that uh, you know punch the originality the. And I think this evolution, like going from two D to three D, is is really just. Uh, a step in that evolution as an artist doesn't mean you leave that thing behind because it's it's always there. I mean, I I went back to animating 2D uh, on a, a short film called um, Bird Karma, you know, three years ago, four, I don't know, five four years ago. Um, so it's always there, and I use it in my job all the time when mm. I'm doing storyboards. I'm still in a way 2D animating. You're still and pulling so, from that bucket. Yeah, completely. I mean. I, I I still think I'm more of a 2D animator than I'm a 3D animator uh, at my, my heart. Gabriele Penacchioli, who David Huber knows very well, he said to me once, like, Simon, you are not an animator anymore. Because I, I was the head of character <laughs> animation. I was like barely animated. He's like, you are only an animator when you're animating. <laughs> Anyways, wow. He was right. But yeah, yeah so. Yeah. <laughs> the animation police. <laughs> but in my heart, in my heart, I'm 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 still very much an animator, and it's still what I'm most most passionate about. <laughs> so. I have um, another question here. I think, but we're almost out of time. We have two minutes left. But David, I I I wanted to toss it to you first because uh, I've been optimal. I mean, I've been um, uh, stealing all the time with all my questions. Oh no, I I had plenty oh. that I've been able to to ask. So don't, okay, don't mind me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm going to ask another one here from the from the from the field here. There was one. There was a question that was asked really early, and I told them to hold on to it. I didn't see it pop back up again, but I think it's still relevant. It's a, it's a question that I'm you know I, essentially I'm going to paraphrase this down about like 
you know, as, as a new person who wants to get in animation, someone's really excited. Um, the world has changed a lot since like, since probably all three of us started, you know, when we were, when we were starting out, you know, it was like, I mean, hell, I, my demo reel was on a VHS tape, tape so I don't know, like, <laughs> that's in, that's right? In. So it's, I mean, I, I mean, I think we came from a very similar era. Like I was born in 1974. I think you were what, like 73 or 73, something, right? yeah. So yeah, yeah, we, so same era. I totally, like we, we would have had very, very similar experiences probably. But now with social media and all these other sort of ways of putting yourself out there, the, the game has kind of changed a little bit, right? It's changed on how do you get recognized? How do you, how do you like stand out amongst the crowd in a, in a, in such a competitive, exciting industry, but competitive. And also, um, you know, there's just so many other things to learn, not just about, like be able to market yourself. Do you have any thoughts on maybe some people, some of the new talent that's been coming up through the ranks that you've noticed? Uh, obviously you've probably, um, you know, discovered a few really amazing, um, junior animators at yeah. your time. Yeah. Like, what, what was it that's made them stand out that maybe some people could learn from today? I mean, it, it, I mean, a, a, it's so much easier to get out there today than it was back then. I mean, yeah. you know, like there were what three, four schools when I went yeah, to animation sure. school that oh, did yeah. decent, uh, and sure. you probably went to another one. I <laughs> went to Sheridan. It was like the yeah, and I went like to the Goblin. So and there was many oh, you went to oh, and that, Yeah, that was a bit. <laughs> and today, there's so many ways to learn this, learn this uh, business, and there's so many ways to be an animator, right? From game to you know, um, you know, online gifts, whatever, like I can't even name them. There's so many different yeah. jobs and it's so much easier to get seen also. Because if you yeah. do interesting work on Instagram or, or, or Vimeo or whatever, somehow you're going to be building um, uh, viewership. And, yeah. uh, and I think the most important thing is for you to try and mm. do what you're interested in right. and express yourself in the way that's most interesting to you. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it so interesting, like the, the, the new towns that are coming up, uh, you know, they're equally inspired by Miyazaki and what, what, what's being done in Hollywood and, uh, yeah. you know, anime. And, like, they, like they, they, their reference pool is so much greater so and so much, big. so different. Yeah. And so, inevitably they're going to do something that feels fresh to us uh, who may be sitting in real reviews and, and things like that. So I think it's, it's really key to just, again, shape your opinion, make sure that opinion is, 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 is uh, distinct to you yeah. and, and that, that it, that it, you know, that you're checking your own opinion against what other people are doing. So if you know who you admire, who are the, like the cream of the crop, whether it's an artist or an animator or a, a painter or a sculptor, like if you be inspired by those people and aspire to become as good as them, the mix of those in, in influences will inevitably shape something mm. that's unique. If you bring a certain degree of talent and devotion yeah. and, uh, yeah. and will with it, um, I think that's how you set yourself apart. And then you just have to, like, don't hold back. I think the biggest mistake yeah. is to hold back from showing your work. Yeah. Uh, right. Because that's, like, you have to be out there to be seen. Totally. And, and put it out Show it to your friends. And you can choose yeah. to be maybe be not on, on one of those platforms. But eventually, I think making it seen is the most important thing. Yeah, because putting it out there, not only it may, it may not get you discovered and get you that first job, but it's the first step of growing towards that possibly because you're going to get some feedback, hopefully, and then yeah. feedback could lead to you improving your work and then eventually getting that job that you really want. But I think, yeah, you're right. Analysis, paralysis or perfectionism can really get in the way of just, yeah. you know what, just, you know, so just do it. Put yourself Probably the there. most dangerous thing is to be, uh, I, I mean, again, because you're probably um, so self-critical because you feel like you don't live up to all these people and how can I ever be this good? I mean, I, I mm -hmm. was that person for sure. I didn't think I had it in me and I was seeing all this amazing stuff, particularly when I came to the Gobelin School and all these amazing French oh, students did this incredible so stuff. But uh, again, that's where my competitiveness kicked in with myself. Yeah. I could live with the fight back that was so much less good than all the other people and I caught up and worked my yep. butt off and yeah and uh and I got there and I think it was because I was surrounded by really great 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 material which I wasn't able to be because when I became an I mean when I dreamed of becoming an animator there was no internet so the only thing mm -hmm. I had was VHS tapes of, of Disney movies. And today you go on art station and you, you find 
the most amazing stuff or, or any other website. So it's much, much more easy to pick your four or five favorite things and try and sort of be inspired by them today than it was back then. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, 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 that's really important. Good advice. Well, um, yeah. we are officially four minutes over. This this conversation obviously could go on forever and ever because um, we know when you have someone like you in the room with so much experience, so much knowledge, so inspiring, it just it just it's you know it's I don't know it just feels like a wormhole we just went down for the last hour and a half. <laughs> I've been um, going for hours. So yeah, I'm, yeah, no, but <laughs> well, I would I would hope that we can somehow convince you to come back and um, and allow us to pick your brain uh, either sure. because. This sure. is, you know, yeah. th what you were saying there at the end, I think is, I think really interesting to note is that Agora community, like I remember when I was in school, you, you, you painted a picture of people that are learning and they improve themselves just by being around like-minded people that are striving for excellence. And I think that, you know, my, my reflection on my time at Sheridan College was more this. I mean, yes. Do we have good instructors? Absolutely. There are some godlike instructors that had amazing information. They were so generous by providing all their, their years of knowledge to us. But the, I think the real magic was the people that you were learning with that sort of propped mm -hmm. each other up and challenged yeah. each other and, and moved together as a group. And I think that what we're trying to do in Agora community is kind of similar but like but by connecting people even further and like having conversations like this i hope could maybe lead to the next person who's like man like i can do this i just i just need to listen to some of these tips and just put my mind yeah. to and make it happen you and know? you so know I'll, thanks I'll, for being I'll, part I'll, of that message i think you have to be you know i, I can't remember whose quote this is but mm -hmm. you know if you don't wake up thinking about you know what it what it takes to get into this field, whether it's illustration or animation or story or anything, um, you know, maybe you're not exactly yeah. pursuing the right dream. I think there's also that you know, there's a lot yep. of people who want to be animate, who want to be what yeah. it means to be an animator, yeah. but don't want to do the work yeah. and oh, don't yeah. have yeah. that passion. And For that's sure. something you have to ask yourself. And then yep. maybe there, I'm sure that doesn't mean you, you can't find your path. It just means maybe you should Absolutely. rethink it a little bit. The one thing I always I'm, I'm going to share this one last analogy. Please do. Is, no one's going to shut um, you down. Keep going. <laughs> the last thing when I when I graduated from the Goblin School, uh, Pixar came through and um, we saw um, Toy Story, and I, you know there was the opportunity to go to work for Pixar, and I went like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do computer animation. I want to be a two D animator. And uh -huh. you know, hey, yeah, it was a nice movie, but uh, that's not for me. Right. And this happened to me multiple times in my career where all of a sudden, you know, it could have worked on the Iron Giant and I didn't even think about it. It's mm. not that I didn't make the choice to do that. I didn't even think about it. It wasn't even an option for me right. in my head because I was so like narrow minded yeah. of where I wanted to go. Right. And I actually think that something I had to unlearn, it's good to be, um, you know, uh, have a target and a goal where you yeah. want to be but not at the expense of missing all the opportunities that might come your way. And just because it's a little bit different than what your idols were doing. Uh, I mean, today there is going to be so many other ways to become an animator and have a really passionate or really like great job and be passionate about it. So you have to make sure you keep your eyes open for all the opportunities to come your way. And they might be different. If your goal is to be a Pixar animator, which I think is a really great goal, and you know, I wish that for everybody. I'm sure that's one of the best, best things there is in the industry. But if it doesn't happen, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you, A, didn't uh, achieve it, and B, yeah. If you keep your eyes open for all the other opportunities around us, chances are you might be, you might be, or you, if you don't take, you might be passing up the next Pixar thing. Absolutely. You know, so, so I think that's something to keep in mind is like, there's a lot of opportunities uh, out there. So much more than when Brent and I were, were getting into the industry. <laughs> Slipping around Way his more. VHS tapes. <laughs> like, those those two movies that were made every three oh. years, um, oh, you know, like it's a lot, yeah, it's a whole different, different now whole different world and it's really great that's really amazing <clears throat> advice and i have i actually know personally of, of several people that need to hear what you just said you know like for, like for <laughs> real like they do they're a little bit too specific on what they consider success you know it's like really right. like exactly. why does it have to be specifically a pixar animator i mean like why can it be just like you know getting to do what you what you love to do no matter where yeah. it is you know what i mean like why it's, is this so specific it's because that they think that that will ultimately define them as a success and it's right. it's, it's a yeah. very very flawed thinking 
absolutely yeah. well, flawed. And it's, again, not to say if you get the opportunity to no, be an animator or picture, by all means, yeah, yeah, you no. got to do it. But but oh, yeah. but that that may not happen, or may not happen yeah. in the way you think it. And maybe there's another path to. To exactly. that place, that, that nirvana yeah. of a animation that nirvana. is, exactly. by the way, ever evolving. <laughs> it will o always evolve. If you find that nirvana, this. you're going to message us and tell us where it yeah, I would love there, to right? go there too. Okay, yeah. please. Because just, I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, I, I'll give you my phone number after this. You can just call me directly. I'll, I'll meet you there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, Simon, honestly, it's been an absolute mm -hmm. pleasure. Um, I, I'm sure that the community really enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did. I know that, um, you know, David and I just love doing these things. And uh, it was amazing. I mean, it's from the day that we saw you on our, like, top target list of, like, can we get Simon on here to talk? And to think uh, that we've so come honored. so far that here you are and sharing all your amazing knowledge and your stories. It's just, it's it's a, a huge milestone for, for Agora community. And um, and it was awesome. I, I Thank you guys yes. out thank there, you for wherever you are. Ago. Appreciate it. It's, I'm so honored to be here. Thanks so much. Perfect. Okay, and yeah, well, give me a ring you, anytime, anytime okay, you want to well, blabber you on. You, you, can, oh, you should have here. talked to people who were here before because they'll tell you, once we get our hook in, we just don't let go. All right? So you've <laughs> done great. it yourself. Thanks a lot, Simon. It. Have a good one. Awesome. Cheers. See you guys. Oh, bye, bye, David. I guess you're going to. See you later. I'll, yeah. I'll read everybody out. Okay, bye, guys. <laughs> bye. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was something. Um, I mean, I kind of, that was a hard interview or like, I call it, they're not interviews or conversations. Cause that's the thing. That's why it goes by so fast. But like, it's, um, I, it was, it was kind of tricky for me. Cause I felt like, how do I, how do I keep the, the fanboy in me at bay and uh, deal with that particular conversation without coming out like too much of a, a, a needy animation nerd with my own questions. So, um, you know, Simon's awesome for, for, for being able to take the questions at the end. I know that you, you know, there's a lot of questions, not all of them got answered. So I apologize if you had an amazing question that didn't get, uh, didn't get answered, but like, Hey, I mean, he, he sounds like, uh, we might be able to rope him into another another impromptu visit, which would be absolutely amazing. So um, thank you for all everyone for being here today. Thank you for taking time out of your day. You could have been doing lots of different things. Hopefully, you know, you either got to watch or maybe at least listened on the side while getting some work done today. Uh, and for those who obviously didn't get to see this, you'll be able to share a link to it in a, a variety of different places that Twitch uh, is already recording this. So it'll be there right away, pretty much minutes after we're done the stream. And you can all, always catch the videos on you, our YouTube channel, um, Agora Community YouTube, YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and eventually Eventually, it'll show up on our um, on our website, which is, of course, uh, agora.community. So um, it'll be you can easily get to it by going to the live page because all of the recent uh, the recent uh, streams are, are put there automatically. So um, have yourself a wonderful day. Stay animated. See you on the next one.